y feliz Cinco de Mayo, which is not a beer drinking holiday as, as, it, as, as many people think it is. It actually has a historical significance. But let me say that um, I'm going to take my eight minutes to talk about um, some more subtle forms of substance abuse, which are very, very important, and p the general public's not aware of them. My information comes from my 25 years of practice with teenagers. I specialize in teenagers and young adults, and from the uh, scientific literature. I would talk about marijuana, and I'm not, uh, I wasn't assigned to talk about marijuana because I lived in Ann Arbor in the 60s. Um, but frankly, that subculture did affect a whole generation of people's beliefs about marijuana, which as of 2011, are being challenged by modern neuroscience. And I'm here to talk about that a, l a little bit. Now, this school has an uncomfortably high rate of marijuana use. Um, the CDC looks at um, the prevalence of drugs in different forms. It looks at lifetime use, have you ever used? It looks at 12-month use, have you used in the last year, or 30-day use. The, the rate, the national rates, average rates for the last 12 months of marijuana use is 21.4 percent. This school reports 41 percent. Um, we can talk after, if you want, about what, why this community has those kind of rates, but let's just talk about marijuana. Um, marijuana, uh, many people believe is harmless. Many people think it should be legalized. I'm not here to talk about the politics. I am here to talk about what we know about this substance and how it affects young brains. We know that there are certain risk factors for use of marijuana so that um, the theme of my talk today is that a lot of what the risk is in context. The context of young people, the context of those people at risk, and the context of how much marijuana is being used. So if you ask me, does one inhalation of marijuana cause brain damage or anything like Dr. Um, Cishan was talking about in terms of death? No. But um, use in, young, in, in the young brain, use at, at high levels, and use um, for certain subtypes that are at risk can result in major problems. The risk factors are genetic, family history of substance use, as well as if the young person has had any predisposing difficulties in any aspect of their life, for instance, if they've had learning problems or attention deficit problems, if they've had difficulties with socialization, if they feel a stress from family or otherwise, they are at risk. Because they are at risk because of very logical psychological reasons. When you're a teenager, you have not had the life experience nor the brain development to be able to calmly and consistently think through problems. Stress is a problem. Life is a problem. Life provides stress. Well, the tendency for a younger brain or a less experienced person is to dissociate or not think about it. If any of you have seniors now you'll real, and you want them to, to complete their college applications, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, so the tendency is to just push it away, do something else, play video games, talk to friends, text, etc. But marijuana is the single most important um, chemical dissociation agent that there is because it allows you to get your mind off of it, think about other cool things, and um, laugh, and just be, not be there in a way that's more pleasurable and less dealing with the facts. Well, unfortunately, such phenomenon, if, if it's repetitive, affects the young brain. We now know, in terms of the burgeoning information in modern neuroscience, that the brain is not mature until around the mid-20s. And there's something called a dyssynchrony, or a dissociation, if you will, between one part of development of the brain and the other. The part that turns on during the early teenage years, the pubertal years, is the part that has to do with feelings, fear, emotion. But the part that is delayed in terms of its development and takes up to the mid-20s is the part that we call executive function. The part, it's the, if you will, it's the controller, the manager, the supervisor of your brain. 
It is the part that keeps impulses down. It's the part that allows you to solve problems if you see a problem and think it through and make decisions and go from point A to point B to point C to solve that problem. Well, think about the lack of maturity of that brain in, in doing those tasks and the frequent use of marijuana. Not only will the person not become developmentally primed to move toward adulthood in heavy use, but the, the very brain itself will create some changes because we know that there's a system in the brain Part of the neurotransmitter system has receptors for marijuana, and we, 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 have, we know that the marijuana affects brain function and might, if you will, hijack the brain where the interests, the wishes, the, the desires of the young person are altered during that frequent use. Um, so we have stages of addiction. And the, various, the simplest way to understand addiction is that someone goes from experimenting with a drug to wanting a drug because they like the euphoric effect to needing the drug. Or in teenagers' cases, to become obsessed with the drug so that they, where they previously were interested in school or sports or some spiritual uh, activity or whatever, they're now interested in where can I find a party where I can get that drug. And we see that progression all the way. And when they come to me in my office, it's often at the stage where the grades are dropping, the parents are un, 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 they're not aware at all of what's happening, even though they know that the child smokes marijuana, but they are, um, weren't given the information that, that it can be much more of a dangerous thing than is thought to be. Um, and hopefully we see them before they get to what we call the burnout stage where there is organic brain disease. There is change in function, function of the brain over a long time so that the person needs the drug to feel normal. And it's very hard to enter into young adult society at that stage of the game. So we know that teens, just to review, we know that teens are at risk. We know that they self-medicate if they're not doing well. We know that the drug is around and available and um, inexpensive, and uh, the, so the agent is around. And certain people will be at risk and fall into that trap and will have um, difficulties in the long term. The last thing I want to say is the most terrifying of the long-term complications, and it's becoming clear now that marijuana is a definite risk factor for schizophrenia in adulthood. Um, it's, it's not a gigantic, highly prevalent disease. We're talking about only 3% of the adult population, but, um, but that the risk factor if marijuana is used is at least three times it is if marijuana is not used. So we know that it's also associated with mental illness. We don't know the cart and the horse, by the, which, whether it's the marijuana that's causing the mental illness or it's the predisposing tendency toward mental illness that makes people want to use, but we know the association is, is very, very high. And I'll stop there and allow the next speaker.